this is the quick synapse of everything right there. But one right off the top would be uh, House Bill 256, which advocates for 100% renewable energy. Oh, Senate Bill 256. Uh, oh, yeah, well, I'm in House Bill 97. 97. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting late in the day. That's all right. That's all, right. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, with House Bill 97, what that asks for is uh, adding renewable energy standards. So it gets the state on the path to 100% renewable energy by 2050. All right, here's my first question on that. Sure. So, obviously, it's 2020, so about 30 years. Um, here's the issue we have with the energy framework. Mm -hmm. um, part is you know, basically the availability of capacity by the different renewable levels, right. uh, the, the new renewal, uh, renewable capabilities, so right. like solar, geothermal, um, hydro, hydroelectric, which we don't really use in Florida that much, but mm. some existing well, capacity exists. The capacity that could be really taken advantage of in tidal power, it's a, an emerging form, where if you put the, the turbine underwater, it allows just the flow in the current of the river or no, the water. You, right. What you also have are transmission, not, not so much transmission issues, mm -hmm. these are the transmission that power. Right. And the question is how much can you actually generate you might go directly into the grid or that you get to store that power. Um, one of the issues we have in renewable, with renewable energy even today, even with solar and all its advantages mm -hmm. of wind, is battery capacity hasn't really changed that much Correct. Um, from, you know, since the advent of, you know, I don't, want to say, I don't want to be glib and say the door itself. So, right, right. Largely, battery, battery capacity has not changed that much. So it's, with renewables, it's not so much the ability to generate, it's to be able to, the ability to store Correct. and then use it at a later date. That's really the issue. Right. To put the state on a mandate on the timeline of 2050 yeah. might force the state to have to commit resources to additional resources past the conversions to do that, which can take away from other state resources, other state uh, initiatives or needs of the state that we can't envision right. between now and 2050. Right. Uh, the greatest example of that is Hurricane Matthew. Mm -hmm. uh, last legislative session we committed a little over $400 million to Hurricane Matthew relief. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not something that we could see or envision, right. but we had to respond as a state. My concern with bills like this is by putting the mandate in, we are essentially trapped putting ourselves into a box without knowing, without if we knowing what other it. future implications are coming. Now, here's what I would also say about renewable power overall. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's, a, it's a definitely a goal we should have. Um, but one of the things that we do have to look at in our country is nuclear energy. Right. We've really touched nuclear policy and regulatory policy since uh, Three Mile Island. Right. right. Seven, it's eight, it's eight, really yeah. taboo to even discuss nuclear power. But, you know, with nuclear power, especially with modern nuclear technology, uh, with smaller reactors where the fuel rods actually 100% uh, spin out and are used where you don't have to store spent fuel rods as much mm -hmm. as you used to, uh, like in the other mountain and then the sort. I mean, are those things that are kind of contemplated in this measure? Measures like that aren't contemplated in that, largely for number for as Sierra Club as a stance doesn't like nuclear, so that's one of those things. But particularly in those bills, when you consider any centralized power source from a defense standpoint, and you take into the consideration of uh, sea level rise or other climate issues, you come into a particular issue. So the centralized power aspect of that isn't really considered, because when you actually use distributed power through solar energy, you create a better defense. If for example, America was against, oh, just foreign attack. Right, foreign attack or anything. Attacks on the grid, a centralized power station is always vulnerable. The entire city, the, just for our example, the entire city loses power because the central power station went down. However, when you have distributed power through solar, you create distributed energy and production points all throughout the city. So anytime that one point goes down, you have another one that can shift power around. I agree with what you. I agree with that. Right. But, but I guess my, my counterpoint is that power generation in part is so that it can be reliably used at yes. all times. Mm -hmm. If you have a decentralized power strategy, mm -hmm. something like solar to the degree, I think that mm -hmm. you and the Sierra Club want to, what you do lay yourself prone to are situations where you could have blackouts and brownouts, or probably more brownouts and more for the right. in certain areas. Right. And so, you know, I know, you know, the people of Florida, although they want to make sure that we are maintaining our environment and protecting the future of our environment, at the same time, people turn the lights on. They want to make sure it's on. When exactly. they go to use a the refrigerator, they want to make sure it's cold. Sure it and so, um, those are the things that we have to balance. I don't. I'm, I'll be straight with you. I don't think I can support this bill simply because of two things. Number one, 
when you put in a, when you put in a renewable standard like this, right. then we are definitely having to focus state resources towards it. And we, you can, we, none of us can contemplate right. all the other things or resources or dollars that are going to be needed by the state of Florida. Right. Um, as somebody who's legislating today, I'd essentially be tying the hands of, of people who would come after me um, to comply with this. And I gotcha. think we have, you know, there are different issues in current in the current constitution of creative funding issues for our state mm -hmm. simply because they were passed by referenda and future iterations of the legislature now have to comply with it of course and but they create time. they create issues with respect to funding in the future and that's that's my concern with that well as far as that one build that particular sticking point of the time frame might be something that's a little more onerous in your in from what you're describing battery technology is advancing and that is coming along Lithium technology allows better energy density. So now people don't have an entire wall of batteries to store for their power. They actually have home units. They do have capacities like that done at Babcock Ranch where they do have storage. Familiar with Babcock. Right. So they have storage that can do that. And that will avoid those brownout situations. Over time, it will get better. But I can understand how you may not be completely comfortable with it. But getting a renewable energy standard, which is actually covered in... The House Bill 540, no, that's not that, but um, House Bill 14, what's the other one? Oh, actually, it's the Senate version that goes into that. But we don't have a renewable energy portfolio, and that's one thing that we really need to establish as a state. So now, if we can actually go down those lines, it, it provides the infrastructure that could be put into place ahead of getting something like storage or batteries and free up that that funding op, op, that funding restrictions that you're more concerned with. But I think so the Senate version might be a little bit more part, And here's the thing, this is important. I think mm -hmm. the part, the question is, is it the appropriate use of state power for the states and all its apparatus and all its buildings to move their portfolio, and to on purpose move their portfolio into a renewable uh, box or a renewable phase? Um, or is it, I'm talking about just, if we're talking about the uses of governmental uh, funding and governmental authority, is that the highest and best use of governmental power compared to all the other things that we have to do, whether it's the education, roads, healthcare, uh, transportation, uh, uh, the court system, the, the, the mm -hmm. civil litigation system, which are core functions of government that we do take as, a, as our responsibility on behalf of the people of Florida. Adding renewable standards into that matrix, my only concern is, is that the highest and best use of governmental funding and, mm -hmm. and authority. The second part is, is that um, we rely on Duke, FPNL, or, or the different uh, electric cooperatives, like many of the citizens of the state of Florida do, mm -hmm. uh, except for the ones who are basically empowering their their cells through right. solar, through solar, through solar mm -hmm. uh, activities um, on their own home. But for the most part, I mean, we deal with the electric companies like most citizens do. Mm -hmm. um, I am concerned. I'll tell you right now. I'm concerned about doing renewable standards simply because. We don't want to get ahead of where the market is associated with energy, energy production. If you talk to uh, some of the electric cooperatives, they've already made a major shift and are continuing to make a major shift from coal fire power plants to natural gas fire power plants. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about levels of emissions between coal and natural gas, natural gas um, has a lower emissions uh, uh, with respect to carbon than with respect to, to coal, to coal or, or, or whatever the case might be. Right. So. That trajectory is kind of already happening in the mm -hmm. energy apparatus. I just don't think it's probably as appropriate with all of the other things that state government must do on behalf of the people of Florida to add this into that matrix. Well, I would respond to that in two cases. Number one, the utilities themselves are moving towards mm -hmm. solar power as largely. I agree, in that. I, I agree with and you on that. So they are. that as a trend is becoming more common. To use funds like that with the state government as an example and a leader it would just be a matter of what pace they'd like to go forward with that. To go all out and sail everything through the wind, I wouldn't say that would be the most fiscally responsible way to go about it. Agreed. But leading, yeah, it the, right. leading the example of beginning to introduce it more and right. absorbing the trend that even the power companies are starting to utilize right. would be smart on their part because we don't have the example of state governments in, in a significant way of utilizing solar energy. And I think that would actually bolster more homeowners to use it in their respect. Because when you're talking about individual small locations, buildings that are under three stories, <coughs> power on the roof could be considerable. So the technology being the advancement of solar allows for smaller 
tra uh, a smaller applications to be put into place and transition and phase out into large capacities or continue to use natural gas as the status quo for larger, bi bu larger buildings or highly populated uh, cities. So now from a financial aspect, it would be tremendously fiscally responsible because the amount of funds that are needed to maintain a solar installation are significantly less than what it does for a natural gas or the status quo. Mm -hmm. So if we look at it in terms of the schools, like uh, removing, which actually is covered in House Bill uh, 5, excuse me, 1419, removing the barriers of the schools to utilize solar energy could save them upwards of 70% in their budget because solar continues to produce as long as the sun's coming up. So you don't have the continual fuel costs with something like natural gas. Okay. So now that same principle can be applied throughout the city, and that example that the, that the state governments put into place helps more homeowners do it, which significantly lowers the demand on the utility grid, because we're right now seeing a glut of natural gas, because we have a big push nationally more than locally in Florida. Uh, nationally, we have extra natural gas because significant significant fields of solar have been put into place. Plus, we have considerable production in natural gas just domestically. Let me, so, let me answer this question. Okay. Now, this is, I, I get what you're saying. I'm, I'm going to talk about the process we're currently in the middle okay. of the session. Uh, House Bill 97, oh, has that been heard yet? It has not. We'd love, we want to get more support behind it so we can actually start moving forward. The bills that we have on that list, I don't think any of them are currently moving right now. Okay. All right, so, but we'd love to get more. All right, I just, I just wanted to, I wanted to know yeah. because these are something that obviously will be probably starting energy and utilities, then we move somewhere to the state affairs, or maybe to right. the commerce and some full commerce. <coughs> so, you know, kind of be you know, one one place or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, solar schools, solar schools, this next one on your list here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'll let me read it real quick. Yeah. Make sure I got it. It's kind of hard to understand there. Maybe you, oh. you explained it a little bit. No, I mean, I know what, I know what net metering is. I get, and I, I know what that is. Um, He's pretty well versed on this. But this one, honestly, I mean, we'll have to see what it looks like. We'll yeah, once to see what you know. Because one of the things happens when bills get agended, um, that's when the members tend to focus more on them and start to figure out what the actual impacts would be. Uh, talking with local school districts, getting their input. The only thing I would think about right now is. In purchasing into a, uh, in, in actually be getting into these agreements and then actually getting the additional hardware necessary to build out solar arrays mm -hmm. for schools, um, the school districts um, they already are having um, they're having to manage tight budgets right now, right. and so you know knowing uh, several superintendents throughout the state, I think even if the legislature said okay let's go ahead and pass this. Um, their first question would be, all right, so now that you pass it, or is the state going to fund it? Um, because they are having to use their resources, obviously, for, uh, for, for educating children, mm -hmm. but even more for that, um, actually maintaining the infrastructure that they currently have, uh, paying their staff, uh, getting curriculum, uh, and so on and so yeah. forth. And the idea at this phase would be, it would be a transition in the maintenance idea, because currently, if they were to go for solar, it cuts into what the budgetary expense that they have per, per pupil. So if they went with solar, it'd take away from whatever they have for books, technology, mm -hmm. or something along those lines. Whereas if right. with this- and, and I, will, I will say under, under current state funding, they do not have the flexibility. Oh, it, exactly. Because we actually, we actually mandate specific areas where dollars are spent mm -hmm. for the education of, of, of children. There's, a, there's a, a portion of that budget, of that bucket, about half, mm -hmm. which is at the discretion of the school districts. Right. The other half is actually mandated about what the areas that they can actually use those dollars for. Um, but let's go back to my point. My point is, is that even if we pass this, we'd have a major funding question because when we pass things here, they, unless we lay out a timetable, they, they take effect as sometimes effective immediately, or sometimes right. later that summer, right. which will force them to go into contract with solar power, with solar, uh, with, with uh, solar contractors right. to acquire the hardware and in the installation order to, in, in order to reach for their schools. Um, I'm not even sure what the fiscal impact of that is. Yeah. At this stage, it's not truly under consideration, right. but the way that we would see it as instead of doing the maintenance or somewhere in their maintenance budget, they could start doing improvements for solar right. or using renewable energy. Right. The idea is that by making transitions like that, you can have considerable impact over. In the case, uh, I generally work, I work with solar power during the day. Right. All right, so when I'm not here, I do that. I look at a home and say that it has five people in that home. Just by moving to a solar hot water heater, 
they're going to save 18 to 30 percent on their electricity bill as phase one. They, they can look and expand on top of that from there. So it's something that can be done in stages without having to do the entire shebang all around shot. Mm -hmm. So it'd be more flexible for them. So that'd be an option right there. But the exact details of it would still need to be made through. And then as that, as that gets fleshed out, it could probably be something that you might be more appetizing you or could be under better consideration for that. But this stage, it's it's mainly just asking to remove the barriers and then look at options from it. Let me tell you a little bit about kind of how we get it. Folks, there was a bill a couple of years ago, um, and I actually think there's a resolution on it now. Okay. And it called for, um, it was something with lead um, in the drinking water mm -hmm. um, at different schools. And so what the proponents wanted to do was they brought legislation, I think I was chair of that committee at the time, what they wanted to do was to get an apparatus bill in every water fountain in yes. the state in right. to get the lead out, to to literally to get the lead out. Right. Um, my first question was, okay, so how many are we talking about? They didn't know. Right. And so when we when we go through these bill ideas, when we go through these conceptual ideas that have real world consequences with respect to funding, the number one thing we do on something like this is we start to ascertain, okay, what is the real fiscal impact Full associated school. with each school. Furthermore, if you go down and dwell down to the individual schools, you have, we have schools in our in our portfolio across the state that are newly constructed. Mm -hmm. And we have schools that were constructed 60 years ago. Right. Does their current um, electrical system in their school, is it even prepared to do this? What's, what will be the retrofitting cost for that? Um, and that will have to be done on a district by district basis. Right. So what you're doing, what you're saying here in this, I understand the thought process behind it, but I also, having served an education committee and also served on the budgetary committee in education, I know, I can already, in my mind, mm -hmm. I'm already thinking about what the barriers are in order to get there. Uh, primarily, it starts with funding. That's, mm -hmm. that's the biggest one. One of the key things is just by having this bill in place and the barriers removed, as new skills, schools are being built, it can be put under consideration. Retrofitting older schools, mm -hmm. it may not be something that the budget would allow, mm -hmm. but it's not restrictive enough saying it has to be done by every school, but it is open enough that if the school can put it into their plan, they can move forward. Is, that, is it at the discretion of the school district to do by themselves? Uh, that specific point, I'd have to look into it further, but I don't believe it's it's mandated that, it, I believe it's closer to the discretion of the schools, mm -hmm. but it's definitely under their mm -hmm. consideration. Right, I guess here's my follow-up question. So mm -hmm. Is there anything in state statute that precludes the district from going ahead and doing this retrofitting on their own with their school properties? Because the amount of that they have available would cut into the people's budgetary expenses. Uh, no. And that's... See, there we go. But right. like, listen, my, my point was not budgetary. Right. I said, is there anything in Florida statute that would stop a school district from doing this today? The fact that, that it would cut state into law. what they would have for, it would cut into what they have yeah. available for. Oh, no, no, we're not talking about the budget, we're talking about the law. Like the, the, oh, the, the, law? the law? Because this is Specifically, a, I this don't is a This is a statutory addition. Right. We're not talking about the budget. The budget's another thing. Yeah. But now right. we're talking about statutory additions. Is there anything in state, in Florida statute to stop school districts from doing this today if they wanted to? No, but as far as, from my understanding, it's a matter of the policies and it's set and forth now. So if they were to say that they would go ahead and do solar, right. it would cut into what they could mm -hmm. spend on pupils, books, their technology, yeah. or any other aspects. So the pie is already sliced right. and they, they'd have to cut away from something else to do that. That would be the big bur uh, barrier right. to actually a school deciding to do it right now. And so it's removing that particular policy. So I, I, think, I, think, I think now we're, we're getting probably closer to the sweet spot here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what the, what I'm, I'm trying to contemplate in my mind what yeah. the fiscal impact will be across the square footage we have across Florida at four right. schools. Um, I know that there are other environmental considerations that the legislature is already thinking through now. Mm -hmm. One of them is septic to sewer conversion right. um, and a lot of waterways and water bodies. That fiscal is about 60 to 80 billion dollars mm -hmm. overall. Um, you know, so, and then another thing, of course, is uh, the waterways restoration, waterways restoration with Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades uh, system, the legislature last year committed in 686 million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're probably going to commit again another maybe 650 million or more. This has been a priority of Governor DeSantis. Mm -hmm. And so, again, this goes back to when there are choices that we got to make as a state, are we going to make the choice of solar power at the schools, or are we going to make the choice of uh, waterway restoration and water cleanup 
in, in the environmental waterways. And so both that's the dichotomy that we have. Right, and you're going to run that on any bill or anything that you have under consideration. Right. You know, which is the most, which is the most urgent need to be done right there. Right. And just removing a barrier, I think, would be yeah. something that's pretty well, I guess that's why limited I came impact. Back, but I think that's why that's I came back to my, my question before mm -hmm. that was, and I'm not sure, and this is why I'm asking you, mm -hmm. Is there anything in statute that stops a school district from doing that today? The funding, I, 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 I get funding, Correct. but is there is there is there a legal barrier that the state as has a legal barrier? I'm not I'm them. not currently aware of a legal barrier that can stop them from doing it. Everything goes back to. I mean, I, I would yeah. argue that's step one. I think mm -hmm. that's step one before you even start talking about dollars. Um, typically, I would say, and I, and I don't know, mm -hmm. but typically I would say I don't think Florida statutes is that granular. Mm -hmm. To how school buildings are powered, right. um, so I, I I don't I don't think it would be in there, mm -hmm. um, but I think when we put it in statute, then what happens is that there's now, and um, I would say like an affirmative uh, 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 opinion mm -hmm. to local school districts that the state is going to step in and help with that funding. Mm -hmm. And so that's I guess that's you know that's yeah we'd have to go into it more. We just have a synapse over. As a, as a broad feeling sure. for for preparation today, but it's definitely something that it, we we would like to see more consideration about okay. because just removing that barrier and moving into more advanced technology, since we know better about technology, we can do better with technology right. rather than continue to pollute the environment. Because energy use, whether it's through the schools, whether it's through somebody's home, is one of the biggest polluters that somebody has. And going down a path that opens that up, and the state leading the way allows people to have more consideration for it. You know, right. kind of like a sponsorship idea. Just because Grand Hill drinks the Sprite, now everybody's more apt to do Sprite. If the state's doing more considerations for solar power and renewable energy, the homeowner is actually more 